Welcome to the Armory Building, which happens to be an armory, or at least used to be. It's actually built all the way back in 1912, retrofitted over the years as part of the living history of the 20th century on this campus. We'll see some of the newer U of I buildings later on, but I've chosen the Armory because it has that indefinable 20th century charm, which comes with crumbling empires and buildings which are showing their age, and therefore it's sort of a truer index or metric of history than a lot of the shiny new stuff. One of the saddest things about the decline of the American empire is the ways that the decline is preventing the empire from accessing its own history. And the armory is actually a good example of this. And it's not because it's a historic building in the sense of being especially beautiful or noteworthy or interesting. In fact, it's precisely because it's so mundane, so plebeian, so ordinary in a lot of ways. It was built as a warehouse for military equipment and later as a training facility. Now you might be wondering what this old building has to do with video game culture. With video games, all roads lead back to the national security state. It was the Cold War military industrial complex which produced computers in the first place. The old vacuum tube computers were basically created to run the very complex and sophisticated equations that you had to solve in order to build nuclear weapons. And then later in the 40s and 50s and 60s, the military remained the biggest funder because the business interests of America back then really didn't have a great deal of use for computers. Uh, it was really not until the 1970s that the commercial side of the industry took off. So the first 30 years of computers were dominated by military spending and military research and development labs. And this is something that Half-Life, um, as a narrative and a game world, captures very, very well, because the action takes place at a military base, and we see the military base literally sort of come apart at the seams in front of our eyes. One of the hallmarks of the digital era is the degree to which more and more of our daily experience is mediated through digital media of all kinds. And one of the things that strikes me, and this is actually a very old experience that I had all the way back in the early 2000s, was the digitalization of memory. I would see things, I would hear tones, I would recognize certain patterns, and I couldn't quite put my finger on them. Where did they come from? Where had I seen or heard or witnessed that before? And I'd stop and think and gradually realize, oh, I saw that in a video game. I saw that in some document of the digital media. I saw that during a playthrough of this, that, or the other franchise. I would argue this is one of the fundamental experiences of the 21st century, the digitalization of memory, which has all kinds of paradoxical consequences and effects. One of the things that Half-Life did back in 1998, Half-Life was the first video game to really capture textures well and to render them in a game world. This was a very difficult task because the rendering software and the computers of the day were relatively limited, but the design team worked very hard and they were very clever because they would pick just a certain set of surfaces in the game world and give them very high resolution textures and the other textures would sort of be low grade or monochrome and you, they wouldn't want you to look at that stuff so they'd, they'd highlight the really good stuff. And it's worth thinking about how history marks surfaces. In the United States we have this problem that we just throw history on the scrap heap and therefore we have to sort of look in the scrap heap. We have to look to the junkyard pile and there may be nothing more American than an auto junkyard to actually find traces of our history. We throw people in the scrap heap, we throw machines in the scrap heap, and increasingly it seems that the whole empire is going to end up on the scrap heap of a kind of a global history that's starting to ensue. Be that as it may, it's a strange kind of unkempt, uncanny beauty to textures which are imperfect, incomplete, missing features, where we have a nice shot of a barrel. This is one of the great tropes of the video game culture. Crates and barrels are sort of these constant themes that run through video game culture. And one of the reasons is that the interactivity in early games was relatively limited. So you could only portray one or two objects that were movable 
or destructible or controllable in some way. And there are small crates, usually, or small barrels. And the idea is these are really simple shapes. You don't have to spend a lot of processing time depicting them or rendering them. And one of the classic institutions of the Half-Life franchise is the soda machine. You might wonder, what the heck is a soda machine doing in the middle of a, this military base? And the answer is basically, this is a running joke. This is sort of an inside joke that doesn't really have very much to do with real life military bases, but has to do with a very different set of spaces and a different site of production, and that is the video game industry itself. One of the interesting features of many video game studios is that you have very qualified people, incredibly smart folks, hardworking, work long hours, and also have a great deal of control over their working conditions and workplace. And have, it's incredibly difficult to create a video game. This is one of the hardest tasks possible. And in fact, it's a lot easier to create a Hollywood film than it is to create a functional video game. because there's just a lot more moving parts inside. And this has resulted in some interesting effects in production culture. And one of those effects is video game professionals themselves, on average, exert a fair degree of control over the working conditions in the United States, Europe, and Japan. But one of the complexities there is there's a sort of a covert contestation between management and labor. It's especially prevalent in the video game space because there's lots of young people and you need to give them outlets, you need to give them creative room, and it's a creative industry. So you need to sort of keep people in that creative bubbling mode of coming up with new stuff. If you just put them into a cubicle and bark orders at them, they're not gonna produce anything worthwhile. So it's a really, really tough challenge to produce a video game. Ah, the joy of air ducts. Air ducts are a relatively recent addition to the video game canon. And it's an interesting why it took so long for this to happen. Air ducts have been around in games since the original Metal Gear Solid, where you go into air ducts and move around those crawl spaces. But Half-Life did something interesting because most of the game takes place indoors inside of industrial facilities and they really used the air duct in a way that hadn't been done before, and that is to make that experience come alive in some interesting ways. Most importantly, you spend a lot of time crawling around the air ducts. There are several sequences where you're going through a long, long passage and crawling up and down and trying to escape from the soldiers hunting you and whatnot. So you're not only spending time in the crawl space, but they make it very realistic with some really, really, really good sound design. So the sounds are very effective. You hear the, the lumps of metal. You hear all the sounds that you would hear, the kind of odd, distorted sound of being inside of this long tube of metal that's connected somewhere to titration and filtration systems of various kinds. One of the profound questions that Half-Life asks, and this question may be unanswerable, is the extent to which we are the creations of the American empire whether we still inhabit its imaginary and whether those structures sort of live on in strange sorts of ways. And this is not just a question of the physical infrastructure, but of the psychological infrastructures, the ways of thinking, the ways of narrating the world, the ways of seeing, the ways of defining what is human, what is alien or not human or not like us. Who, who defined that us in the first place? It's a very political question. And it's not necessarily something that Half-Life answers per se. I think it defers the answers because it has to satisfy certain genre conventions. Today, however, uh, more than a decade after the original Half-Life, it's worth asking whether the end of Half-Life actually contains some interesting clues as to the present era, what we might call the dawning post-American era, or at least the post-American imperial era. The empire is coming to an end. Hopefully it'll be sooner and with the least amount of damage rather than later. Time to choose. Wisely done, Mr. Freeman. I will see you up ahead.